Hi again. In this session, we'll go through how to read an outcomes research article. Outcomes research articles in science typically follow the same format, IMRAD, Introduction, Methods, Results, and Discussion. It's a roadmap. It helps you orient yourself and focus on the parts of the article that will be important as you either are doing research or aiming to make a clinical decision. So this article, The Effects of Clinical Pilates Exercises on Bone Mineral Density, Physical Performance, and Quality of Life of Women with Postmenopausal Osteoporosis, focuses on multiple assessments, multiple outcomes related to the practice of Pilates. So the uh, article from 2005, and in general, research articles are going to be published in peer-reviewed journals. If, article, if journals are not peer-reviewed, you'll know those when you see them. This is a peer-reviewed journal, and like a lot of Pilates research, it's coming uh, into English language journals from international sources. So the first thing we want to do is we want to look at the abstract, and if you've seen my other uh, videos here, ignore the abstract. It only serves two purposes. One is to help you decide whether or not you want to read this article, and two, to the terms in the abstract provide metadata that help with the indexing and the finding of the article. So we're gonna read it, we're not gonna index it, don't need to read the abstract, it's really a decision tool. And why is that important in particular in outcomes research articles? Because the abstract does not have enough information to help you make a decision. So that's another reason why you always want to, whenever you can, get the entire research article to use in your research. So the first thing we wanna look at, we've looked at the title, we've looked at where the authors are from, we now want to go to the end of the introduction. So we're gonna skip through the introduction and scroll down whoop, right to the paragraph above the method. So in the anatomy of our article, we want to come here and we want to find the purpose statement. All research articles should include, outcomes research articles should include a purpose statement. I'll highlight this one for you. and. That purpose statement is going to help you understand why they chose the design that they chose. So the purpose here is to determine the effects of clinical Pilates exercises on bone mineral density, physical performance, and quality of life of postmenopausal women with osteoporosis and to compare the results with the control group. So right here, this tells us that they're looking to see if there is any effect of Pilates at all. This is a phase two clinical trial equivalent. Is there any effect at all because there is a control group? So hang on to that idea. We come to the first line of the methods and they say this study attempts to do this or aims to do this, but we want to get insight. They should be telling us in these first couple paragraphs, what was our research design? They're not so obvious with that. What we wanna know is the previous paragraph tells us that there was a control group, so how did the patients get, or subjects get into the control group compared to the subjects that were in the treatment group? So they do have their enrollment criteria, and actually I'm gonna pop over right here to say here's my randomization. Generally speaking, this sentence is going to appear earlier in the method section, and they randomly I uh, divided the subjects into two groups, one Pilates and one was a control group. So this is a randomized controlled trial that should go right up here. This randomized control trial aims to, etc. So got to find it in here somewhere. Uh, they did have uh, permits and approval for this, so the study was conducted ethically. And what we want to now look at is we know the design, randomized controlled trial. Let's find our inclusion and exclusion criteria. This will introduce bias into the study. So postmenopausal osteoporosis can go up to any age, as old as women can possibly age. Um, because this is postmenopausal osteoporosis, males would be excluded, right? Uh, even though males are at risk for osteoporosis, they're not gonna be included in this study. So um, the criteria for inclusion was that they had to have a certain DEXA score. They were over the age of 40. Some women do hit menopause younger. Um, and having been in menopause um, for at least one year, no history of fracture. So they're diagnosed with osteoporosis, no fracture yet. And um, scrolling back upward, they were voluntarily able to participate in exercise. 
and they had some type of osteoporosis medication. So that's going to introduce some bias. They're already taking medication. Now they're going to be doing Pilates exercises. They were excluded from the study if they met, even if they met all the other criteria, if they had heart disease, kidney or liver inflammation, um, obstructive lung disease, those who'd been exercising regularly. So this also is important because they're taking women who were sedentary, who didn't exercise. They're screening out the sicker patients. So even though sicker patients could have benefited from this, they wanted generally healthy patients to be included in the study. And so they had the Pilates group and then they had the control group. And so the control group, we wanna look through the methods right quick here and see what happened with the control group to see they were not subjected to any program, but they had the same evaluation. So they were a true control group. Something we wanna remember is that a placebo is not possible in Pilates research. So there is no, you can't have a placebo controlled trial. So this is about as good as you can get comparing Pilates to a no treatment condition. And so, uh, lots of information was gathered about the subjects, demographic features, bone min they did bone mineral density evaluation. They did a six minute walking test, pain evaluation and evaluation of quality of life. And they should give us a little bit more information about these assessments. If it doesn't happen here, it will happen in the results section. Um, one of the things they report here, who did the assessments, the measurements and the Pilates training were done by the same physiotherapist. So this was a very small study, really more than likely if I didn't had to dig into this a little bit more, uh, it's either graduate student research or early faculty research because they're doing it on a shoestring budget. They did statistical analyses using SPSS 16.0 for Windows. That's a little bit old. I don't remember what was what version was available in 2015. And what they were doing was they were doing a comparison within each group, within the Pilates group in particular, at the beginning and the end of the intervention, and then also a comparison between the groups. So between and within in a two group study. So let's scroll back on up here because what we want to look at is the intervention itself. So even though it's Pilates, all Pilates is not exactly the same. And so they had a multi-week study and in their first session, they did this. In the first three weeks, they did this series of exercises. And so they identified hundreds one, hundreds two, swan dive two. So one of the questions we wanna think about just looking at this is how, what, what are the numbers two, one, two, and three signifying here? Chances are good it's some sort of progressive adaptation of these exercises, but that's something we want to keep in mind to look at later. But they describe these exercises, and so for something like Pilates or for yoga or for exercise, knowing what the intervention was is important because you as the clinician, as the Pilates instructor, the PT, can replicate it. If you just said they did Pilates, and did not describe what they did in the sessions, then we can't really replicate it. So we don't really know how intense or advanced or simple the intervention was. So this is their list of exercises, warm up and cool down. And if we scroll down to additional exercises, now we see some variation. They say clinical Pilates, but there were exercises with a TheraBand there were exercises with a ball. They call it a Pilates ball, but there definitely was some progression. And so if we look at these exercises, now we see mini squat. Um, we see a couple of other exercises, um, chariot pull. This might be something lost in translation, diamond press with arm openings. But if we're aiming to look at consistency across all of Pilates or all of yoga, or all of exercise, or even all of massage. Having a constant taxonomy, constant language, or consistent language will be really important for replic replicability of the interventions. So they describe some nice detail here. Last thing we want to look at, maybe not the last thing, um, we have the exercises are gradually made more difficult every three weeks, depending upon adaptation. After the six week, they introduced the green TheraBand. So apparently universally green TheraBand means something. Um, and then they introduce the ball as well. So they're adding in some props and a little bit messiness. We want to come back up and say statistical significance for between or within groups. They set their significance level at P.0.05, which is pretty standard. 
So within the whole method section, you want to have your takeaway to say, did they have a stats plan? Did they describe what their intervention was? Did they tell where the subjects came from, how they were enrolled in the study, how they were excluded from the study? So we already know that older patients, potential subjects who might have been a little bit sicker, and all the men were excluded from this research. So that's going to affect our generalizability. Now we look at the results section for the paper. So they further describe the minimum number of subjects needed for their study. And um, that's important for small studies because it's very difficult with a two group design or even a three group design to get adequate power in the results. However, the control group was doing nothing. So if we're looking at is Pilates better than nothing, we'd like to hope that any physical activity, any exercise is going to be better than nothing. And so the better than nothing is on bone mineral density is their first outcome. And so we can look at that and say, regardless of any of the other outcomes, if we're looking at improvements in bone mineral density, any weight bearing exercise is considered to be good. And so bone mineral density, it was observed that the difference of BMD values between the groups was significant in favor of Pilates. Yay, see table seven. The six minute walk test is kind of interesting because there are a lot of functional fitness tests and that's really what part of this is for older adults and their subject group was kind of young. But a six minute walk test gives a little bit of insight into potential cardiorespiratory fitness improvements. And so um, they write significant difference has been observed in favor of the Pilates group at the comparison between the groups at the six minute walking test. Um, but what's kind of strange is in the previous sentence, they say no significant difference was observed for the control group. So I think what we can conclude is that the Pilates group got better. The control group did not. That's no surprise. And it's a little unclear from the writing here whether it was significant comparing one group to another. So we will need to eventually look at table 10 and try to discern that on our own. Pain is the other outcome. So we so far have bone mineral density, six minute walk test, functional abilities, pain. Are you in less pain after you exercise? And so I'm not exactly sure where pain correlates with this in osteoporosis because when sometimes when people exercise, they're in more pain later. So you probably want to dig into the pain question a little bit more, but then we get to the quality of life. They used a visual analog scale, by the way. So I'm not sure what pain means, but quality of life, there are lots of different surveys that look at overall environment, social, emotional, physical perceptions of health and well-being. And so they used a survey here, the Qualefo 41, um, and it is a quality of life questionnaire that's been validated in the Turkish language. And um, so that's what they're using, the FF, SF36, SF18. Those are things that we often use, the fact and the facet uh, assessments. And so the Pilates group, after exercise, everything had lower values showing higher quality. So it's a little bit backwards. In the control group, however, there was significant difference in the negative direction after the second evaluation. So they had multiple evaluations here. And, and it looks, again, from the writing, it's a little difficult to discern. But the difference of quality of life of the groups, as in between the groups, were significant in favor of Pilates. So this is what we really want to look at throughout this whole study. I'm going to highlight that for you as well. We want to look at the differences between the groups at the follow-up to see if Pilates is better than nothing, the control group being the nothing group. So for all the assessments, at this point when you're looking at the results, read through the pros, then scroll down and start to look at the tables. The tables are pretty mathy, and so that can be a little bit off-putting, but you want to look here to see if there are differences between the groups, even though they're randomly assigned, the Pilates group is older than the control group. And we're looking at the body weight, and, and, um, and BKI is probably body mass index, but uh, translated into Turkish, I guess. And body mass index was pretty much the same. And um, meters, presumably size is height. Bone mineral density values seem to be pretty much on target. And so you, in looking through this, they're reporting the control group compared to the Pilates group. And, and seeing, so here there were um, some differences 
uh, between the control group and the Pilates group in bone density it looks like. So you want to dig into this a little bit more in the details but know that you're not responsible for doing a meta-analysis if you're just trying to say okay I want to use this in my Pilates practice to help women understand if they've been diagnosed with osteoporosis and they're postmenopausal, there would be benefits of Pilates and that's going to be our big takeaway. So looking through the tables don't get concerned so much with the mathiness of it you can look for asterisks and that shows you when something's statistically significant so that's important to look at and again we're really primarily concerned with differences between the two groups at the follow-up so the discussion in the discussion section there's the information about what it means so in looking at this um, what happened what it means one of the big takeaways they, they note that um, uh, they, they say there were no differences between the demographics of the women between these two groups even though it looked like the one group was older but they had similar characteristics and so comparing Pilates to nothing in general Pilates ha is associated with favorable improvements and we want to think about what that means clinically and clinically that means referring women for Pilates who meet these criteria is probably just as good as conventional exercise so if we look then in our the limitations section of the discussion section we want to see if we can scroll through and find that generally speaking authors will um, write in some limitations they'll disclose something that will help lend us to future research what's a little bit strange here is that it seems like there's a whole other discussion section that's happening with a bunch of new citations generally speaking you're going to find this information in the introduction um, we're seeing this more and more and so that's something to keep in mind about how you would use the discussion section of the paper um, so scrolling through here looking for limitations um, that's something again that we want to find in the research because that will help us interpret what the researchers have done and um, not really seeing that here so that's something that we want to think about uh, what uh, in, in terms of what they're disclosing we know already that there were minor differences between the treatment groups we know already that the groups were um, uh, one group was older um, so that's something to keep in mind and what we then want to think about is future research or clinical application. So we want, we in our discussion section, we have what it means. They got a big long section on that. Um, what the limitations were and and what where do we go from here? And so the where do we go from here is what this means clinically. And so they say in this very last sentence, group exercise has great importance amongst rehabilitation approaches that aim for health among the community. And so I think what they're trying to say here is that there's a benefit and the research shows the benefit. They believe that bringing the, uh, the exercise program brought together subjects of the same pathologies will be effective in decreasing pain and increasing quality of life. And it seems that their research shows all of that. So what's missing here is either a clinical application for who should be doing this or where future research should go. And I think we might conclude in looking at this design and saying, is there any effect at all? And the answer is yes. Where future research goes next is to compare Pilates to standard of care, whatever would typically be recommended for women in this situation to see if there are discernible differences. So the researchers don't go so far as to say that. We can conclude that on our own, but that's the type of uh, information you'd be expecting to see at the end of the discussion section. So some parts of this, especially the discussion, are a little bit messy, but if we scroll back on up and say, you've got a roadmap for how to weed your way through the article, and there are some parts of it that might seem highly technical that you can just kind of look over and say, I don't need to worry so much about that unless you're going to try to replicate the study. And if you're gonna try and replicate the study for future research or use this intervention in your practice for your patients, you want to think about whether or not you can use some of these assessments, probably not bone mineral density, but getting your clients to come back and report, but also looking at the functional fitness test, quality of life, and asking clients on an ongoing basis about pain. So hopefully this was helpful. Happy researching.